and now we go to um, the panels of the program. And the way this will work is we will have four sets of panels. Uh, each will be started by an impulse speaker to set the ball in motion. And we will start looking at um, the, the individual developer, the, each, the smaller company, and then we will grow the perspective, looking wider and wider from the investor to the ecosystem to the global world. Uh, so this is what we have for you. We have a great show for you. Don't go anywhere. You're in the right place. Um, and um, my first panel is uh, financing the growth of studios. And for the impulse, I have Spielfabrik's own Søren Lass. Søren. Good morning. I'm fine. I'm just sharing my screen here. Is it, is it working? Do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, okay. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, great to be here. I just have to switch off the, the Twitch one so I don't get any feedback on the sound. Um, so basically, yeah, I'm, um, I, I was working with, I've been working with uh, Spielfabrik and Media Deals over the summer to prepare for this uh, workshop. Um, so uh, we looked a lot at uh, the financial situation of, of gaming studios in, um, uh, in, in, in Europe, particularly in Germany, but we also had uh, studios uh, participating from Finland, uh, Sweden, and, and, and Denmark in this. So, um, so the goal was really to identify some, some key areas concerning finance that, that have an influence on, uh, on the stability and growth of, of uh, gaming studios. Um, so we did a, a number of interviews um, and panels uh, over the summer. Um, with the uh, studios that uh, can be considered mid-sized studios, so normally they were from like 10 to 20 people uh, strong, had all been founded within the last uh, 10 years um, and they were all in, in a quite solid uh, situation. So our goal was really to identify, you know, the experiences that, that they've been uh, uh, making in, in their journey. So we identified three different uh, main topics uh, or areas that, that I think are relevant for this discussion today. Um, so the first one, of course, is, is as everybody knows, access to funding. Uh, uh, that's, um, of course, always a big topic. And the general consensus is that the situation for game developers in Europe uh, at the moment is, is very positive. It's probably better than it has ever been. Um, there is uh, various uh, public funding initiatives like uh, the, the, the Gaming Fund in Germany and in different countries, um, but, uh, but also a lot of uh, private money in, in the industry right now, um, as, as we all know. Um, however, the, uh, the situation is quite different uh, during the different um, uh, stages of development that the companies are experiencing from the founding phase where it's still relying a lot on um, uh, public funding, also uh, own investments that uh, small um, studios put in, into their company over the growth phase where publishers are, are becoming more relevant um, and, uh, and the consolidation phase when it's actually possible to uh, sometimes uh, live from uh, royalties that you've previously gained, even though that's still something that's uh, more the exceptions than the case. Um, um, we discussed uh, the experience Experiences that studios had with the different funding sources, and um, while there is quite a lot of access to capital in terms of public funding and publishers at the moment, um, what seems to um, to be uh, yeah, sort of uh, going through the different countries is there's still challenges to speak with banks and investors and get money from those. Uh, it was a big topic in in, in Germany. Um, in generally, there are investors uh, in the games industry now, like LVP, like amplifiers and others, but uh, non-gaming investors are still very difficult to, um, uh, to, uh, to access and, 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 to, and to grab. So that's, that's a topic um, to see how, um, you know, how can companies get more better access to, um, to those sources. Um, another big topic that we identified was financial crisis. Uh, almost all studios that we, uh, we, we, we talked uh, to had at some stage in their um, uh, development uh, hit some, some major crisis. Uh, and, and, and this is something I also I worked with a lot of studios in Europe over the last years, have seen again and again. Um, it's most likely going back to the fact that a lot of the finance that is coming from publishers, um, 
and, and public funding as well is uh, project funded. So a lot of developers uh, at some point hit the wall. You know, you, 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 you manage to get funding for a, for a large project, you grow your team, but then the search for money starts again. So, so this short to mid-term funding um, structure in the industry is still a problem for most studios. Some, most of the studios, all of the studios were able to survive, but to some of them, it was um, basically um, sometimes luck, as they, as they said, uh, sometimes uh, hard work and uh, also situations that could have been avoided. Uh, most of the reasons were um, trying to find new funding for projects after a project had been finished, but sometimes it's also, you know, you're running out of cash why you're developing a project um, that might take longer and you're not able to rebudget the game or you're relying on, on royalties uh, and the game has maybe not performed as you expected. So, um, so a big challenge is to, um, you know, how, to, how can we avoid these situations, especially for small to mid-sized studios, as this can sometimes um, really destroy some um, uh, studios that might have some, some big potential but uh, not having catered for this um, uh, can lead to these uh, issues. Uh, the third topic uh, was more the practical financial management. Um, most CEOs and managing directors of the studios we, we talk to uh, are still personally dealing a lot with finance. Some of them would rather uh, develop games, uh, but are thrown into the, um, the complex tasks um, of, of managing the finances of their companies. And, um, Especially for small to mid-sized uh, companies, it's uh, difficult to, to hire a full-time CFO simply because it's, uh, it's, it's quite an uh, expensive task to have. And it's not always needed anyway to have one. Um, but uh, as companies grow, um, the financial side becomes more and more complex. And it also goes back to the other topics we identified. I mean, if you have a long-term cash flow planning you might be able to anticipate some problems that you have after a project is finished. So long-term planning tools and, um, uh, and ability to, um, to uh, draw on some uh, yeah, financial know-how is, is something that uh, would probably help a lot to the, um, to, to the current studios and, and avoid some of the, um, the challenges that, that are coming. So um, something that could be discussed today could also how to better educate um, uh, CEOs or managing directors of studios to, to deal with this. Ideas that came up were things like, uh, you know, there could be sort of like a game finance certificate that, that could be done on a, on a European basis uh, where, where you uh, learn these uh, tasks on hand or special courses that can be developed. Of course, also networking with other uh, companies that have been uh, have experiences or a pool of gaming CFOs that, that could be hired in if needed um, is, might also be an option, but is up for discussion. So, um, so overall, um, to summarize the, the market situation for raising funds is, is, is very positive at the moment. However, the finance is still very project-based uh, and that is an issue for, for long-term sustainable um, uh, growth uh, for most studios. Um, there is a need for more uh, financial know-how among CEOs that's often learned on the fly. And things very often depend on personal networks, uh, especially when it comes to investors. Um, so there is not this free market where, where you can freely access uh, capital and pitch your company. Um, and uh, some contingency preparation for, uh, for avoiding these critical situations is also something uh, where I think some help can be making a big difference. So finally, as, as a spark to this uh, panel, um, um, I think the key message is uh, the financial situation, the funding situation is quite positive at the moment, but it needs more in order to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to really keep the European games industry uh, growing. The, um, I mean, the games industry is, is uh, over $150 billion right now, is expected to grow by around 10% over the next year. So everything is looking bright. But something like consolidation uh, in the market is something that might also hit at some point. Um, and maybe, you know, the, the Swedish companies on the stock market that are investing heavily in, into Central Europe right now. The Chinese companies uh, might at some times, at some point, not invest so much anymore as, as their um, uh, capacities for creating games have been built. 
So how do we secure that uh, mid to small to mid-term companies can survive in this ecosystem if there's maybe less money floating around? All right, Saren, thanks a lot. Uh, that's a clear message. We, we read you loud and clear, and it's a great start for my first panel this morning. So let me invite my panelists. Um, I have a, a great difference in perspectives, difference in diversity in perspectives for this panel. Uh, so um, good morning, everybody. And uh, ladies first, Ina Göring from GAME. How are you doing? Good morning, Pear and everyone. Fine. Thank you. And you are here in Berlin, right? Almost. Almost. Home office in Brandenburg. Oh, okay. So close. So close. Well, welcome. So you're, you're, um, you're physically in Brandenburg, but you're virtually in, I don't know, maybe cyberspace. Uh, also, I have uh, Astrid uh, Refstrup from Triple Topping. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, thank you. And are you in Copenhagen by any by any chance? Yes, I'm in Copenhagen. We are still also from a home office with kids in the background. All right. Well, at least I nailed that iPads, one. So all good. <laughs> all good. And you are um, you're a game developer for with triple topping, but you're also an investor. So you you have both the 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 dark side. I have side a, and the I have the privilege side. to play with other people's money. So I work as an advisor for Carbon Nights. That's great. We'll come back to that. I find it very interesting because you have both both perspectives. Okay, and then I have from, from my native Sweden, Sebastian Badilak, straight out of Lund, is it? That's correct. Good morning, Per, and good, good morning, morning, everybody else. <laughs> Excellent. But you're you're not so famous for, for your work in Lund, but maybe more for your work in a, a different city in Sweden. Yes, that's right. Skövde is sort of where I started my career. I used to study there and then I uh, was part of building that whole game development scene uh, there. And yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, and f if somebody by, you know, some random way is not familiar with the success story of Skövde, can you just drop some hits from that community? Well, well I think the first major hit was Goat Simulator back in uh, 2014. Uh, and then uh, Raft uh, came in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, and then most recently uh, uh, Valheim, of course. Um, so yeah, all of those are out of that city, and there are also other games there uh, yes. that could be mentioned, but let's, let's stick to those three. That's great. Uh, we're already very impressed. Thanks, uh, awesome. Sebastian. All right, and last but not least, I have uh, uh, Damian Ududa. Um, yeah, exactly. Is that right? right. Hello, Hi, everyone. Morning. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today. And you're the head of investments uh, uh, for the games funding, sorry, the games program for BPI France. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And where are you in the world? In Paris, am I guessing? I am in Paris, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Happy great. to be with you. <laughs> okay, great. So I nailed three out of four. I think that's a pretty good track record. Uh, all right, Damien, I'd like to start with you then because. Um, uh, we already heard a little bit from the bank, uh, another bank, uh, Société Générale, another French bank. Um, and also in, in Sir and Lasse's um, uh, impulse, he talked about banks as maybe being the part that can be challenging for, for, for game developers. Do you share this view that uh, it's difficult for, for game developers to get funding from banks? Yes, this is correct. And I think from the two point of views, I mean, uh, from the studio point of view, it is difficult to raise funds, and from the banks, it is difficult to to give money. So for some reasons, and maybe the presentation from Soren was really accurate uh, from that. So we from BPI France are just acting to ease the financing and to try to to make the flow the, the, the flow more uh, comfortable for everyone. So. We are uh, operating a certain number of uh, uh, financing, uh, and especially the warranty. For example, uh, the private bank uh, that are giving loans to the pre to the studios, we are giving warranties to them just to help them uh, giving fund. And then, from the bank point of view, and from the studio point of view, we are also uh, trying to educate uh, the. The ecosystem and to give uh, the CEOs from these studios 
uh, the ability uh, to have the good uh, level uh, when they come to talk to bank. So we, in our uh, um, DNA, the main goal is to ease uh, the financing uh, system uh, because we know that this is a prototype industry. This is multi-year uh, project from the, the games. And really often the banks are not quite familiar with these uh, matters and we are just trying to help them, uh, everyone from the ecosystem to for the system. So that's one of our mission, that's correct. You're working to educate the banks. And you, you said that the, the warranties, are that is are those uh, relying on public money? So you have public funds for the, for the warranties? So we are directly uh, warranting with our balance sheet and we are also uh, operating direct loans to the companies on the for the, the, the video games. So we we do both. So we can directly uh, uh, um, uh, give uh, money to the companies, but also uh, warranty private bank or private investor. And that's correct. That's from uh, uh, our balance sheet and from uh, European resources as well. So that's the two main activity from uh, financing point of view and as well from 2019 uh, we opened uh, an equity uh, financing uh, fund uh, just to have the whole picture and now we are giving a warranty direct loan and equity because we know that with the equity you can have a big leverage on uh, corporate funding and especially from loans uh, for the for these structures that needs to have strong balance sheet to uh, to manage different projects and multi-year project and prototype projects. All right, that, that's great. That also touches on one of the other topics of project funding versus company or corporate funding. So, so we'll mm -hmm. come back to that. Well, now I'd like to go to, uh, uh, to Astrid for the, the... I come to you first as a developer and the point of view of, of trying to um, get funding for your games project or your games company. But first of all, you didn't get the chance to brag about your games. So wh what games, what game have you made that you're most proud of? Uh, our recent release, I think, uh, Ynglet is a game that we published together with Niflas. Um, and I'm pretty proud of that because it was just a part of itch.io itch bundle of uh, like um, saving a nature. I can't remember the name. And it just closed uh, yesterday and was very successful. Uh, but other than that, we also released uh, Welcome to Elk uh, last year. And right now we're working on our next project that will be announced around March, but it's about punk music. Exciting. And how did you manage to get budget for this project? Uh, many sources. I think in this kind of conversation, I first of all just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of other invested people in the games industry in general out there. Uh, so when we are talking to access to funding, there's just some people that have uh, way more challenges uh, than other to actually even just get to the table where you can discuss money. Uh, so if any of you are listening out there and want advice, like feel free to reach out to me because it is it is definitely different if you are from a, a minority in the industry. Um, so in triple topping, we did a lot. It's many different sources. So we have public funding. We had we, we uh, released a game together with a publisher that covered marketing. We had the early angel investment uh, incubator program thingy. We bought them out. Then we got then we got money from Kaolo Knights, which is a game fund that I also work for the, from them today. And then uh, last but not least, we also have uh, investment through um, a safe uh, agreement uh, with Netties. So it's uh, it's all it's all the way around. And in the beginning, of course, it was uh, it was personal savings. That's that's a that's a great example of the complexity of of funding a, a games it's, project and and. And the very many different strategies that need to be applied. It's it's constant strategies, and I think there's not. Uh, I never thought of this as like, okay, we're just gonna find a pro uh, publisher for the next game, and then we're gonna release it, uh, or like now we're going into fundraising again. It's it's a constant thing, and I'm constantly thinking about like how my money can, uh, how my money, how my company can be attractive, not only in terms of the game we're developing right now, but also what we are as a studio. Um, so it's an, it's an everyday practice that I enjoy a lot, and I think it's a, it's the best part of my job. 
Well, Saren last said in his uh, impulse that uh, a lot of game CEOs pref would prefer to make games than to deal with all the complexity of the of the funding. Then you should find a, another one to be the CEO or at least the business developer of the company. All right, that's very good advice. Straightforward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks Honest. a lot, Astrid. Uh, I'm also curious about your work as an investor, but let's hear some other voices from the panel first. So, Ina, I come to you now. Uh, another point that was from uh, from Saren's impulse was that there is a lot of funding available uh, for, for game developers. In fact, he said it, the times have never been this good. Um, do you agree? I mean, talking to your members in, in the German association, do, do you agree with that assessment? Um, yeah, definitely, I agree with this. But this, uh, for at least speaking for Germany, has kind of just recently changed. So the, the public federal games fund we have now, which has 50 million um, annually, so each year, um, this has just been in place uh, since late 2019. So really, it just came into effect 2020. We're just kind of having like the second year of this big opportunity. And before that, the situation was quite different. So we could definitely not say there is a lot of public funding for games. It was um, before that, introducing the federal fund, it was all up to regions, so regional funds. So it really depended on where as a studio you were located. And then also the funds were very limited um, in, in contrast to the film industry, for example. So usually it was just like a tiny little annex and the, the, the whole atmosphere was, I would probably describe it as more hmm, conservative. Um, as now you presented the banks from France, but it's a very different um, look in, in, in Germany. The banks are just really slowly opening up. So. Um, coming back to our like the funding situation, yes, ever since uh, 2020, I would say this is a big opportunity. And if I may add, we just recently, the numbers are very fresh there from beginning of this month, uh, we did a survey with our members. Um, how their outlook is on the whole situation. And I have to say, generally, 54%, um, so more than half, have a very positive outlook on the future business developments they face as a company. And yeah, that really shows. Um, oh, no, actually, even more than that, 69%. I was looking at the wrong chart. So 54 were actually positive looking. You know, we just elected a new government. So that has a great impact like on a general base. But no, the positive outlook on the whole um, yeah, business development is 69 to so 70%. So yes, for, the, for Germany, the situation is very optimistic. There's now this fund. And I think it all depends on how accessible this fund will be. Because, um, yeah, with money involved, like you already stressed before, you have to know the finances, you, you have to be business savvy. Like Astrid said, if you're not, then you really would have to look for someone that is, because it does take a lot of time to handle the money. But as we know, it's the basis of, you know, your business uh, life and companies. So, yeah, but this is all, all changing. But generally, uh, in Germany, it's, it's a very good yeah, phase right now, like you said. Maybe better than ever, uh, speaking for Germany, yes. But there's lots more to do. Speaking of the banking with the yeah, sector and also private investors. But I think they start looking at the German scene right now. Okay, well, that's great. And, and how fun, all smiles, uh, except that's not great for a panel. We need to find some pain points and do some complaining because otherwise, what's the use? So I, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do in, in terms of, of problems. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but, but thanks, Nina. Okay, Sebastian, uh, this, it, it seems like everybody's happy and smiling. I don't, I, I'm not going to pressure you to, to, uh, to disagree with that. But this wasn't always the case. I mean, you've been part of building uh, the Skövde community for, what, a decade or so? And it, it wasn't always a hit. How, t tell us about the early days. Yeah, I, I guess uh, um, only a decade ago, um, maybe a little more, it was a completely different scene. I mean, um, just getting your game uh, discovered uh, by, by publishers or get, even getting a look at just getting in the same room as a publisher was uh, difficult enough. Uh, 
let alone talking about uh, funding the game. Uh, that was, uh, I, I don't think even, um, like for indie game studios, that was not even like uh, really an option. Of course, there were some uh, publishers that were early on that ball, so to speak. But I, uh, from, from my own perspective, it was uh, super uh, difficult to uh, sort of uh, present a case as a completely new uh, game studio uh, pitching a game to, to actually receive funding for that. Uh, even from industry players, let alone like public funding or or banks, that was just impossible. That that wasn't there uh, at all, uh, in my experience. Okay, well that's that's great. At least now we have some a dark place to go to <laughs> if we get too happy on this panel. But what changed then? What what was it that that changed the situation? Well, for, from my perspective, I think that uh, social media uh, has contributed a lot. I'm just in the sense that it's sort of the medium that everyone uh, is using to just update uh, themselves on on the developments in the industry. And uh, I, I think it kind of goes uh, both ways um, because as, a, as an indie developer, you can easily sort of post your game on social media. Of, co of course, uh, at this point, it will probably drown in all the uh, noise uh, anyways, but at least there's some chance to making it official that you have a game and it uh, you know you can present it any way you want and you can even change how you present it over the course of time and you can sort of keep updating on it and, and um, create some sense of continuity uh, that sort of builds uh, your credibility in the end towards publishers and publishers and other uh, key actors in the, in the industry are probably sort of uh, watching lurking in all the correct channels at least i am lurking in many channels to see what indie game developers are, are producing these days um so that definitely helps and uh you know and anecdotally speaking speaking just uh, a week or so ago uh, i reached out to a game developer who has an interesting game and sort of started pitching my case as a publisher to him and he was like, uh, yeah, I've already been approached by 25 publishers. Uh, so I, I don't think I can even make time for a call. That's what he said. So, I mean, the tables have kind of turned, uh, I would say. Um, and yeah, I would attribute some of it to social media. Wow, that, that's really cool. So the game developers can now be the divas. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's a great look for the long term, but I love it. Let's enjoy it for the moment. Uh, Sebastian, fast forward then, uh, and the most recent story of, of Valheim. We're, we've all been blown away by this game, both uh, the creativity and, and uh, the hit, the commercial success. How did this come about? Uh, we're not exactly sure how it came about. Uh, it was very unexpected, but I think um, in terms of um, um, our stance as a publisher, uh, is to sort of uh, work on a game until we feel that it's it's really good. So just meeting our own uh, quality bar is really important. Uh, and I don't know, maybe everyone is uh, doing that, but I get the sense that some some games are definitely rushed to the market. Uh, and and I think that that is just not uh, you know you can't do that anymore. Uh, there probably was a time when there wasn't as much competition. Uh, specifically talking about Steam, I think that's where we mainly exist. Uh, so it, there was just no way to sort of make comparisons on a sort of uh, uh, like having having that much uh, awareness of games and the quality of games internalized. Uh, I think it's the first time in history that people actually have that ability. So. Um, quality of the game is really important, uh, obviously. But then, uh, basically, in terms of uh, trying to reach out uh, and verify that you're on the right track for making a game is really important. So, sort of prior to release, leaving no stone unturned in terms of making sure that everyone uh, is aware of the game, that you have uh, actual traction for the game uh, before you release it, and sort of try to time tr time that release when you're at your peak of awareness, so to speak. And that's, that's I mean, it's just uh, 
dark magic. Uh, so I don't, I, I can't, I don't have a formula for you. But I think that uh, just uh, try, trying your best at making sure that everything aligns is is basically my <laughs> my uh, perspective on it. All right. Well, well, great. Th that's a great phrase. Black magic. That yeah. let's that that might stick. Um, let's go to Damien. You you um, uh, so listening to Sebastian and talking about uh, the attention to detail in the black ma black magic process of of launching a game. What does this make you think uh, as a banker in terms of risk assessment? Well, uh, from well, there are two risks. You know, it depends where, where where you are on the value chain. Obviously, you are you don't have the same risk when you are a publisher and when you're a, a creative studio. I think if you are financing your your game, and it all depends on how and how much you finance your game and how much you take it to the market with which we with uh, the adequate le level of risk and how much value you will uh, uh, share maybe with the publisher. But I would say for uh, financing a video game, the, 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 I mean the the particularity of the of the sector is that you take very different, as it has been said, uh, sources of funding. You have public funding, tax credits, uh, industrial resources uh, like the minimum guarantee, and then you have the corporate financing like uh, loans, equity investment. And all these fundings are mixing and they have different consequences and different payback. So the outcome can be very different uh, if you, how, how, depending on how you mix all these fundings. And yes, the vision of the risk, of the risk will really differ from a, a publisher to the a creative studio point of view. So uh, we are assess, uh, assessing the risk with a different uh, point of view. And th th that risk assessment, that, does that change the terms on the loan, like things like security and interest rates and, and payments? D does it also change that? Yeah, it, it can. Obviously, it can uh, be very different from uh, if you are a publisher with a 10, 15 game slate and, uh, and if you are a creative studio with one game, multi-year uh, budget and uh, you're going to like risk everything to launch it yet yeah, the, the obviously the the interest rate and the vision of the risk will not be the same and it will reflect in the cost of uh, funding obviously mm -hmm. uh, okay since since i have your attention I, I'll, I'll keep the spotlight on you for for a second so it it appears that the french banks uh, are more active in in the games space than some other parts of europe non mentioned why, why do you think that is well, I think that maybe also I would add that the, the, the generation, the, the creator and the creative, uh, maybe is more mature now than it used to be uh, from a financing point of view. It was very correct and it, it has been said before. Uh, the, create, the creator is a, a fundraiser and a game, re and a game uh, developer now. It has the two uh jobs uh, i mean every day the, the the goal is to create the game and to secure funding just to 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 take to take the project to the end so maybe i think it's used not to be as true now that in, to be more true now that in what it has used to be uh in the past where maybe the creative were more uh well less funding driven than they are now and you spoke a little bit about educating the bankers. Will you also educate bankers in other countries, please? <laughs> with pleasure, with pleasure. Let me come to you and uh, we, we share uh, the best idea. Okay, that's but, great. But <laughs> maybe on the other how would you, how would you improve uh, the, 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 the funding, uh, in your opinion? In uh, Why are the banks not so active in, uh, in your regions? Yeah. That's that's a good question. Let's let's pass the baton to Ina to see. Do you want to develop on that? Do you have a theory why why this is the case? I do have a theory, <laughs> but I mean it's not based based on fact, but rather on experience and uh, talking to bankers. I myself used to work in a bank. 
um, at ILB and the new head you will later have on a panel, I think right after the lunch break. Um, so maybe he can, uh, you know, elaborate about this. But usually I have to say, it's, um, you mentioned this, Damien, maybe it is a thing of the generations because um, I have to say the heads of the banks are in Germany, you have your stereotypical 60 plus uh, cis white uh, male man. I don't want to start the bashing, but um, usually they have no contact with the medium yet. And so they're very distressing. And I myself experienced whenever you have a generation change, like all doors flung open because there's no question. Like it's always like the answer is, yeah, sure, great. Uh, let's start the conversation as we experience with politicians. Um, so maybe it is still like, um, it's maybe it is a generation thing. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but it appears to me in personal experience. And that's why, but that's why I'm expecting it to change very soon. And you have more open ears for the subject because I did go to banks, showed them all the numbers, you know, and you all know them, we all know them. It's just such a driving industry and with so much uh, potential. And I was always taken back, like, why wouldn't every anyone like jump on this topic immediately? No, they didn't because they don't have a feeling for the industry yet. Um, I think it's maybe too risky. And uh, yeah, but as we all see, banks have to change, right? Nothing is set. Uh, big uh, banks facing trouble. There's new competitors in the banking markets with all the, you know, strictly online banks. So I think they will have to move. And it's just um, as we experience so much change right now, this is happening. Um, this will happening in Germany. I will see this. But um, yeah, and even though the, the middle ground of the management is already like very open, there are still the big CEOs you have to convince. So Damien, um, you're very welcome <laughs> to come to Germany and uh, do, do the, you know, do some education maybe. Um, yeah, we appreciate this. Okay, great. So yeah, we, we have more banks on, on the later panels. So we'll definitely talk more to, to banks today. But Astrid, I'd like to hear from you now. Uh, so as an investor, can you do you do you see yourself acting differently or you're an investment advisor, maybe, but do you see yourself acting differently from other investors with your developer background? And if yes, how? Uh, yeah, I think like always when, when you have to, uh, to look at a company, uh, project, uh, you bring your personal experience into the process. Um, so in Carlo Nice, what we do is, is project funding, and we're not a publisher. So that means that we would uh, cover all of the costs of like Q&A and marketing and so on, whatever the developer needs to successfully release the game. The money ro runs through the developer to Carlo Nice, just to, to explain <laughs> where we are, <laughs> what kind of money it is. Uh, but I think one of the things of course, I is looking at the game, but what I'm most interested is in is what is the team that are making this game? Uh, is there someone on the team that care about business development? Um, is there someone that cares about growing a, a community? And I don't, it's maybe not as important if they have done it before, but just like if there is people there who would like to learn this skill and, and who want to uh, want to educate themselves on it uh, that's important and then also very much like how are they how are they looking at running a studio because everything can go wrong when you're doing whatever game so it's the stamina and uh, and the studio's talent to like readjust and iterate and they work together for a very long period of time and making sure that no one uh, burns out for example um so a lot of indie studios are pushing very, very hard. And that's because maybe of milestones with a publisher, or whatever. They're so pushing very, very hard. And that's put that on the team members and the employees. And if they burn out, they have to find a new one. But they don't have a big HR department to just keep sourcing in people. Um, so that's actually something I see as a little bit of a risk if they don't, if they don't think about those part of, of running a, a game company and making a game. But if they are thinking about it, I think, yes, then a game can maybe not work in the beginning or they have to overcome big design challenges, but then they will overcome it in the long run. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the things I'm focusing on uh, when talking to studios. 
sometimes I think the maybe it's a little bit weird questions like, yeah, so how do you work together? And what is a day? What does a day at new studio look like? Can you describe that? And they're like, yeah, but the game, yeah, but also this other part is actually quite important. So it's like a holistic view as an investor, a holistic view yeah. of the studio. I almost get the impression that you sometimes um, hold hold the the, the, the the management back and ask them to to uh, take it easy. Is that is that true? Uh, the management you think of the game, or maybe rephrase. Well, so if if the if the game if the head of the game developer is pushing uh, the developers, the workers too hard. Um, do, do you find yourself in a position to, to tell them to take it easy and, and of take course. their foot off the gas? Yeah. Of course, yeah. That's like I, I think uh, small studios, startups and, and indie studios, they cannot afford to lose people. Like if someone is sick for six months and it's your core team, like, it's your, like there's two programmers and one is down for six months because you push them too hard. That's quite expensive. <laughs> uh, big, big AAA studios can afford to do that uh, because they can source it new people, and that's maybe also the evil side of the industry. Uh, but I would, I, I think any any publisher, any investor would be uh, instead of saying, "Hey, there's no more money, just get to this milestone." They should look at like, okay, what is it that the studio need in, in order to to release this game? comfortably. Uh, do they need more knowledge on a certain area? Uh, do they need more time? Uh, do they need to learn about management? Like there's a lot of parts you can look at. But I think that's important. Yeah, it's a human touch in the investor, yeah. quite far removed from the sort of faceless uh, investor venture capitalist stereotype. So, so thanks for bringing a human face to games investment. Astrid. Okay, uh, I want to come back to Sebastian now, and um, uh, there's a there's an, a very interesting case. Well, first let's say this: you are uh, part of a publicly traded company uh, structure in, in in Sweden, and we kind of touched on the topic of, of publicly traded games companies. But um, let's let's start with that. So, w w what does that mean for you as a business, uh, being being owned by thousands or millions of shareholders? Uh, I think so far we haven't really seen the effects yet. Um, we were uh, acquired at the end of 2018. Um, and I, I think that, uh, that the only thing I can sort of see is from from the perspective of the of the market, obviously everyone following Embracer and uh, putting their money on Embracer uh, is hoping that we release uh, these hit games over and over again. I mean, as a group uh, and us being a part of that group, obviously we have to contribute to that. And that definitely puts some pressure on us uh, that we perhaps um, a dimension of pressure that we didn't uh, put on ourselves before. Um, what that amounts to, uh, I cannot really say yet, but uh, I, I think that there's definitely uh, a sense of, of that uh, that dimension slowly trickling in and affecting us in some way, um, at least on an individual level, but not yet uh, as, uh, as a company uh, within the group, uh, as far as I know. But you said that you were acquired at the end of 2018. Was that acquisition uh, made possible with with shares from uh, from from the stock market or released to the stock market? I mean, it's been very popular with with the M and A strategies for the publicly mm. traded companies. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, the way I assume Embracer usually does it. So yeah, that, it was a sort of a combination there. All right. Uh, another interesting acquisition uh, was. Um, uh, Framebreak Studios, a small team in, in Skövde, and uh, they were acquired very early in their uh, in their evolution, let's say. Um, I know it's 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 one of the other companies, one of your sister companies that made that acquisition, but can you explain that to us just quick? Yeah, um, uh, based on what I know so far is that uh, Amplifier Game Invest tends to uh, offer um, uh, something as a uh, you know 
to to the indie slash solo developers they basically offer uh, a fully financed ready-made company uh, for them that they run for the developer uh, meaning that they basically acquire uh, all of it at once from the beginning um, and uh, the pitch is more or less that if you want to focus on building your game then you know let us take care of uh, of the company uh, and I, I guess that f for some people uh, it is attractive because uh, maybe having done the whole uh, uh, entrepreneurial journey, you might feel that, all right, uh, I would rather just focus on the game if I have the option. Then again, I assume like a lot of people are in it for that entrepreneurial journey and thus letting you know, go of, uh, of your entire company might feel a little bit uh, too much. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that uh, it's an offer that is interesting, that has a that has a place in the ecosystem. Um, because yeah, not, not everyone uh, is, um, you know, neither interested nor skilled in, in running a company. And I think that uh, if they can put their maximum efforts into making a great game instead, I totally think it's for the best. Yeah, that's a, that's another way to deal with one of the challenges that uh, Sarnas mentioned in his impulse, the, the sort of um, uh, un unwilling CEO. Folks, we're out of time. I, uh, oh, we have a, f a question from the chat, and that's great because if you, for those who are following us on, uh, on Twitch, um, uh, I have a question. Educate CEOs of small game companies. Small companies will take time, obviously. How should startup companies, like one to four people, handle this? Most often, these people are heavily involved in development. Wouldn't it make sense to offer such companies some kind of affordable production and finance management help? Can you outsource the management of your company to somebody else? We just had one example of that with the amplifier investment. Uh, do, do you, do anybody else on that? Uh, it's, it's great that somebody is watching this and, and they're looking for answers. Yes, Astrid. I think, yeah, you can, like you can work with a publisher and, uh, and make an agreement where everybody understands that this is what you are going for and be aware that that is what you're doing in the studio. Um, you can also, you can also, if you like, if you are pitching to to a publisher and a partner, add that role in your budget. Uh, it depends on the budget size and, and what kind of game you're making. Uh, but I think sometimes indie developers could actually be like, hey, we want to have like a financial officer, a biz uh, type. Like there is job roles that we could maybe sometimes add, and it could be a part time or having someone uh, consulting the studio. Uh, that could that could be a way around that I don't see that many people do. Um, but for for many startups, I would recommend if uh, if no one is interested in that side of it, then definitely go for a publisher. Okay, so I guess the takeaway is that there are many different answers to that question, but the answer is not to ignore it. Find a way, even if you don't like to deal with it yourself. Uh, friends, we're running out of time. I think we're already in injury time, but uh, I want to close um, uh, because we're approaching Christmas and uh, I give each of you a, a, a wish for a Christmas gift. I cannot promise I can grant it. I also, it doesn't have to be uh, about games funding but it can be about games funding. So what is, what is your Christmas wish, uh, Damien? Uh, I wish to come to uh, Northern Europe, guys, and uh, help your bank financing you because I think you're worth it. You deserve it. <laughs> That's great. OK, Sebastian. Uh, yeah, I, I think I wish for more sort of those game hubs uh, to pop up here and there uh, as we see all over the world. But yeah, uh, I think uh, I, I, I wish that countries would invest in those kind of kinds of places. Excellent. Thanks. Ina. I wish for our German games industry to grow holistically. And um, yeah, we, we are 
facing a change now in government and uh, we will be moved to a new ministry. So I'm wishing for a, a smooth transition and, and further holistic growing. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Nina. Okay, last but not least, Astrid, what's your wish for Christmas? Uh, more prototype funding for underinvested people in the industry in general. So people of color, women, uh, people that has a handicap and so on. Definitely. Okay, that's great. Let's see if Santa thinks that you have been naughty or you have been nice and maybe your wish might come true. I want to thank you for joining me this morning and sharing your knowledge. It's been a lot of fun and I learned a lot. So Merry Christmas to you and uh, see you soon, I hope. Thank you.